On the occasion of the college's dedication held on October 11th, 1893, Bishop Dennis Bradley, the first bishop of the Diocese of Manchester and co-founder of the college, spoke with the following words to the gathered clergy, guests, Benedictines, and students. We find in our midst an educational establishment like this, in which we have a college, an institution of learning, within which the youth of our diocese, the youth of the entire country, who may wish to enter, his, enter its doors, will receive that higher education which develops the faculty, not only of the head, but of the heart. Let this day be the beginning of days, because it marks a period of benediction to the present and future generation. The purpose of my talk this afternoon is to provide historical touchstones in the academic life of the college. To this end, it is apt to begin with the early years and why the Benedictines of Newark, New Jersey were invited to Manchester. It was Bishop Bradley's dream to have a college in his diocese, and the Benedictines were his first choice. Through his connections, Bishop Bradley convinced the Benedictines of St. Mary's Abbey in Newark to build a college to, quote, educate youth both for the sacred ministry and for the learned professions or for business pursuits. The first step in establishing the college was constructing uh, St. Raphael's Parish in 1888, followed by the incorporation of the order in 1889. In reassuring Abbot Hilary Frangle that the Diocese of Manchester would do whatever it took to help the Benedictines build a new college, Bishop Bradley said, in reference to the college, I would say that we ought not wait until we can build on a grand scale. All colleges grow from small beginnings. I am sure the clergy will willingly assist and furthermore, the institution would soon be self-supporting. Bishop Bradley's optimism in the success of the college, as well as his support of the Benedictines, would remain throughout the rest of his life and inspire the Benedictines to carry on. Construction on the college building commenced in 1891, but a fire in 1892 delayed the college's opening for another year. The college opened to students on September 6, 1893. There were only a few buildings on campus in 1893. The college building, now called Alumni Hall, served all of the college's curricular needs and was where students studied, prayed, and lived. Other buildings on campus include the Eaton House, a small house and barn in front of the college building, and the Worthley Barn, which housed livestock located near the site of the new dormitory. In 1895, the studio was constructed and was used for novices as well as Father Bonaventure Austin Darp and later Father Raphael Fisterer to paint church murals. The studio is now known as Raphael Hall. The college was self-sufficient. Water was pumped from a nearby well. The monks harvested vegetables and fruit, fruits, raised cows and chickens, and even had its own bakery. The college was in the country. Nothing but fields, some trees, and a few farmhouses surrounding college, the college's property Though unobstructed views of Manchester certainly allowed students' minds to wander, even if they were not allowed to leave the campus without permission. For many years, St. Anselm's was composed of a few different programs. The college, the preparatory high or high school, and for a brief period of time, the minimums program, which was a two-year preparatory program of seventh and eighth grade students. During World War I, the Benedictines put more emphasis on the minimums program to stabilize enrollment losses due to the war. But declining enrollments forced it to be discontinued in 1919. The high school was closed in 1935. Enrollment in 1893 was a little over 100 students. For the college, there were two programs of instruction, the commercial program and the classical program. In addition, there was a theological option for those young men interested in entering St. Anselm's Seminary. The commercial program was a three-year course of studies that instructed students in business. They were required to take classes in religion, bookkeeping, penmanship, English, composition, algebra, history, geography, and French. Optional classes were provided in typewriting, shorthand, telegraphy, music, drawing, Spanish, Italian, and German. The classical or liberal, liberal arts curriculum was more comprehensive. 
It was a six-year program designed to study religion, Latin, Greek, English, French, mathematics, history, logic, rhetoric, composition, literature, natural philosophy, and Gregorian chant. Students entering this program would be expected to continue studies in law, medicine, or the church. While the curriculum of other Benedictine colleges in the United States was similar to St. Anselm's, this college had the distinction of being the only one where French classes were mandatory. In fact, early college catalogs state that the study of French, quote, will be obligatory to meet the demands of the New England states. During a meeting of Benedictine abbots and delegates in 1899, an important curricular reform was agreed upon for all American Cassinese congregation schools. A new eight-year classical course for all um, would include four years of preparatory school and four years of college courses to receive a Bachelor of Arts degree. For the first time, there was a standardized program for the Benedictine schools, and it, it coincided with Abbot Hillary's five-year tenure on site to turn its finances and enrollments around. Over the remainder of the 1890s, enrollments ranged from a high of 155 students in 1895 to a low of 51 in 1898 a low that would not be reached again until the lean years of World War II. Concerned with the low enrollments, Abbot Hillary made the unprecedented move to reside at the college between 1900 and 1905. Over this time period, enrollments rose to 118 students, and by 1910, there were 126. The first commencement exercises occurred in June of 1894. Since the college was not formally established with a charter from the state, the ceremonies that day awarded students medals and prizes for neatness and politeness, <laughs> Latin, rhetoric, mathematics, bookkeeping, penmanship, piano, and violin. The college received its charter in 1895. The cost of attending the college in 1893 was $180 per year for room, board, and tuition. This was raised in 1896 to $200, and was not increased until 1917, when it was raised to $250. When judged by today's standards, rules governing students' activities were quite restrictive. With little time for anything else, the students lived and studied in the same environment as the Benedictine monks. Their lives were semi-monastic, awaking at 6 a.m. for morning prayer and mass, breakfast at 8, classes afterwards until noon, lunch, and a short break, classes until 4 p.m., another study period, supper at 8, followed by evening prayer, prayer and lights out at 9 o'clock. Wednesday and Friday afternoons were set aside for recreation such as hiking and other communal activities. Exclusive friendship was against the rules. By 1919, Father Bertrand Dolan, later abbot, was director of the college. Under his leadership, the college underwent a period of evaluation and curricular development that transformed the college. Father Bertrand made a greater distinction between the college and the high school, including having separate faculty for each program. He met with deans at a number of graduate schools to determine how courses taken at the college would affect our graduates' placement in graduate school. <clears throat> Father Bertrand also received permission from Newark to send several monks to Columbia University to take graduate courses in the sciences, a necessary move to improve the teaching of the sciences at the college. When he later became abbot, he sent monks on to graduate studies to benefit both the college and the monastery. Until the 1930s, the faculty was composed primarily of Benedictines. The few laymen on staff taught French and science courses, were college physicians, and coached one or more of the sports teams. One interesting late professor from the first years of the college is William Olmsted, a medical doctor who was a brigadier general in the Civil War. He arrived at the college in 1894 and served for a few years as the college physician. He taught chemistry and coached the football and baseball teams. In 1895, Olmsted arranged a meeting of Civil War veterans at the college so students could interact with war veterans from the local community. Initially drawn to the college to explore a possible vocation, he ultimately took vows with the Order of the Holy Cross at the University of Notre Dame. The education of the early faculty varies. Abbot Hillary and Father Hugo Paff both obtained doctorates in Rome. 
Abbot Hillary in theology, Father Hugo in philosophy. Other monks went through the college program but did not go on to uh, graduate studies. In 1894, there were 15 professors, 12 Benedictines, and three lay people. Between 1930 and 1939, faculty expanded from 20 to 37, with a greater number of lay professors represented. By 1979, the faculty consisted of 104 full-time and 41 part-time professors, majority lay professors, half of them held doctorates or terminal degrees, and 53 were tenured. When Abbott Hillary resided on campus between 1900 and 1905, he instituted weekly meetings with the faculty to talk about program innovations. In 1908, the faculty de debated the merits of receiving state certification for the high school program, and ultimately received it. In later years, the college received accreditation for its own program. Participation in, ath in athletics was one of the few things besides hiking that students were allowed to do, and it was encouraged by the monks. During the 1893 and 1894 academic year, the college fielded competitive football, baseball, and even a track and field team. Basketball was introduced in 1908. Due to funding issues, football was discontinued in 1914, but reinstated in 1933. It was discontinued again in 1942 uh, because of the war, and again reinstated in 1990, 1999. Students had many choices for other extracurricular activities. Besides the college band and orchestra, there was also the Dramatic Society. Beginning in the late 1920s and lasting through the 1940s, the Student Bird Banding Club was the most popular, popular student activity outside of sports. In 1936, the Student Council was organized to, to promote intramural sports, but eventually became responsible for most extracurricular activities. It was composed equally of day students and boarders. The Civilian Pilot Training Program was initiated in 1939. Courses were taught at the college with supplemental airplane training held at Grenier Field in Manchester. Between 1943 and 1944, the college hosted a detachment of the Army Air Forces. Few students outside of this program were studying at the college. After the Army Air Forces left in June 1944, the college had less than 50 students and faced the real possibility of closing. To help with expenses, some monks taught at other schools, in Saint, including St. Benedict's in Newark. The college and monastery needed something more. Help came when a neighbor and friend of the monks, John Daly, left his, his estate to the monks. This gesture saved the college. Returning veterans helped increase the student body. In 1943, there were 44 students. By 1946, there were 500. And in 1961, there were over 1,100. Increasing enrollments gave the college the flexibility to add new majors, certificates, and experiment with interesting academic ideas. By 1964, there were 14 academic majors, and in the 1980s, there were 20. In 1951, the first major, a business major was created. In 1963, the Department of Geography was established, which later developed an interdisciplinary urban studies program. In 1964, the political science major was offered for the first time in 1969, an associate's degree in criminal justice was established, from which the criminal justice major emerged in 1971. The early 1950s saw the college engage in partnerships with other institutions. In 1952, the college co-sponsored a two-year training program in textile manufacturing with the Massachusetts Technological Institute in Lowell that did not take off and was discontinued after a few years. Between 1954 and 1967, the college sponsored a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree th through a joint program with the Manchester Institute of Arts and Sciences. In 1961, the college entered into an agreement with the University of Notre Dame to create a five-year cooperative engineering program. The next major change in the curriculum was the humanities program. This program was born out of a shared interest of the faculty, administration, and board of trustees in redesigning the curriculum. The pilot program began in 1974. In 1976, the college received funding for the program from the National Endowment for the Humanities. The core curriculum commenced in 1977 and shaped the college's future. Another factor that changed the landscape of the campus was 
the admittance of women to the Bachelor of Arts program in 1974. There were, however, a limited number of women students studying at the college prior to 1974. The first women at the college were part of a short-lived program the college sponsored with the Sisters of Mercy in Manchester called Our Lady of Grace Academy. In 1930, a cooperative agreement was signed to admit young women into the Bachelor of Arts program. There were 37 women enrolled in this program in 1930, and in 1931 it numbered 90. In total, 10 degrees were awarded to women from this program. The program was discontinued in 1932. Women appeared back on campus when the college began hosting courses for local hospital nursing programs in 1949. 1952, the nursing program was founded. The founding of the, adv ad <clears throat> excuse me, the, founding of the adv advisory board of trustees in 1957 was a development that shaped the future of the college. It was a strategic attempt by the Benedictines to reach out to local and regional business leaders in order to help prepare the college for the projected increase in college-age students in the coming decades. The first meeting of this lay board dealt with the future direction of the college, a proposed building project. The Benedictines wanted a library. The advisory board suggested that other buildings be planned for, such as a science building, a student activity center, a gymnasium, two new dormitories, and a church. While the church wouldn't be completed until 1966, six buildings were ready to welcome the class of 1964 to campus in 1960. The advisory board of trustees would continue to serve the college until 2009 when the corporation reorganized the board under a shared governance structure. The alumni were first organized in 1906. There are far too many alumni to, uh, with outstanding accomplishments to cover today, but a few worth noting from the early years include Bishop John Peterson, class of 1895, the first graduating class. He's the fourth bishop of the Diocese of Manchester. Archbishop Joseph Rummel, class of 1896. Archbishop of New Orleans, who desegregated New Orleans Catholic schools in 1962. Frank Provost, a member of the Bird Banding Club, class of 1935, director of the Florida Medical Entomology Laboratory, who was a noted specialist in the study of mosquitoes and insect control strategies. Ray McLean, class of 1940 star football player who went on to have a successful career with the Chicago Bears and coached for both the Green Bay Packers and the Detroit Lions. The success of students learning in the liberal arts has always been a concern of the faculty. In its first application for accreditation by the New England Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools, the college submitted the following in answer to a question, for what purposes is your college organized? The college responded, St. Anselm College was organized to provide a liberal education for young men under Catholic auspices. We believe that the individual and social happiness and the democratic ideals so closely identified with our national life are best attained by providing as large a group as possible of truly liberally educated young men. That is, not so much individuals expertly trained in any single profession or science, but those who can view the problems of life and society as a whole, and who consequently are able to rise above the narrowness of individual ambitions and direct their activities, at least to some degree, in the interest of the common good. As we enter this 120th year of the college, and next year the 125th anniversary of the founding of the Order of St. Benedict in New Hampshire, Remember the pioneer spirit of the Benedictines from Newark as they ventured northwards to establish this college. Their courage to rebuild after the fire of 1892 should never be forgotten. We also remember the lean years of World War II when the college was on the verge of closing. The, Benedict, excuse me, the Benedictine fathers and brothers have established a precedent. Their resolve in responding to crises, instructing and caring for students and administering this college allow us to move forward in service to this institution while listening to the spirit of Bishop Bradley's reassuring words, all colleges grow from small beginnings. Thank you.